my name is Bernard Kucher and welcome to a special edition of Center Frame Interviews where we talk to filmmakers from all around the world. We're hosting a special edition today which is a round table of the UK Film Festival. We've got some amazing filmmakers with me today. We have Sudanese filmmaker Susanna Mihani. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. We then also have the Swedish writer-director and Student Academy Award winner Jonathan Etzler. Hello. Hello. And we've got Austrian filmmaker and uh, do documentarian Lukas Ladner, who made the film Eva Maria. Hello. Thank you for having me. Susanna, let's start with you. I find your background and your cultural history really interesting because uh, you're Sudanese and Russian of, uh, of origin, but are now based in Qatar. So you made the film Alcit, and I'd like to find out from you how your cultural identity informed you making your short film. Yes, uh, definitely. So uh, I grew up in Sudan. I was a, a young girl and a teenager in Sudan. Uh, my mother is Russian. My father is from Sudan. Um, and people are always asking me about uh, the confusion in my life. How confused are you? Um, but uh, I think the, the level of confusion with anybody's identity isn't necessarily just revolved around their nationality. It's about identity of self. Who are you, you know, at every stage of your life? You know, are you a student? Are you a lover? Are you a brother? All these questions are things that we have to grapple with. And, and nationality is just an added uh, dimension to uh, how we understand ourselves. Um, I, I think that it has helped me in my filmmaking insofar as uh, I can take a step back from um, national identity. Uh, people grow up very patriotic uh, about their countries, but I was always in between. Uh, so I don't have that sense of patriotism at the same time that I have a love of culture. So I'm in love with Sudanese culture, but not necessarily in love with the Sudanese state. Um, and we had a military government for a very long time that didn't allow you to be in love with the state. Um, and I don't know if any of you have seen the news recently, but three weeks ago, we had another military coup in Sudan. And yeah, we so, are, yes. well, I am not there currently, I'm in Qatar, but people in Sudan are protesting on the streets because they do not want to go back to that authoritarianism. Um, so in my film, uh, we see lots of different uh, types of people, including somebody that comes from the diaspora, somebody that comes from Qatar, uh, a businessman that comes from Qatar to develop the cotton fields in Sudan. And so I use my experience of being away and coming home um, as as a, as a way to form uh, this young man's character. I think that was a really interesting um, uh, approach there too, because clearly also the there's a resentment towards the diaspora that um, that at least uh, Al Sit has, um, and the others seem a bit ambivalent, but uh, about it, but still can tell the difference between one Middle Eastern country and another Middle Eastern country. You know, so um, clearly the um, it's not just about what your own identity is, but how much you recognize somebody else's, um, uh, and I found that. Uh, a, a really uh, um, fascinating take in this story. Also, you you decided to not give your leading woman a voice, but you gave Al Sit all pretty much all the female voice in this. And I wanted to know from you why that decision was made. Well, that that really is reality. It's reflective of uh, women in different states of their life and how they gain power through age, through maturity, through experience. So matriarchy is, uh, is a very strong position in Sudanese society. Everybody respects the grandmother. You know, my grandmother was blind and tiny and, you know, so old and frail, and yet everybody listened to her. She was still a kind of powerful figure because more so than uh, her persona, it was her persona that was powerful rather than her stature. Um, and young girls uh, all over the world, I'm sure, uh, but in, especially in conservative uh, societies, have very little choice. And I found that to be the most interesting, to show different women and different levels of power, because people usually ask me the question, is the Sudanese woman powerful or weak? And I'm like, that's not a question. You know, there's no there's no one such thing. There are different women in different positions, depending on their age and depending on their social status. Yeah, I found it really. Uh, I found it a really uh, a curious take. It's something that we, especially in Europe, but also in the U.S. 
<clears throat> don't really see in the same kind of dynamic. Um, you see versions of it, I guess, but even in more conservative cultures, it's uh, the contrast is not as harsh as what I saw in that film. I found that a, 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 an interesting take. I'm going to switch to Lucas now because he made a whole film about one very, very interesting woman. Lucas, um, tell us a little bit about Eva Maria and how you um, managed to and not just meet her, but also what inspired you to turn that into a feature film as opposed to just a short film. But I'd love to hear also from your perspective, what brought you to this story? Yeah, so so I met her not as a, as a protagonist or it, it was not like an active research I did, um, but she was my employer. As you can also see in the, in the movie, um, I'm also um, quite present in it because I'm working as her personal assistant and that was the way how we um, were getting to know each other. I was moving back from Berlin to Innsbruck. I was looking for something to work, uh, some work where I can do movies on the side or at least short films. And then I um, was passed on to her through a friend who was already working for her. And um, we connected quite fast and I was very fascinated about um, her character about how she was living her life and at the beginning there was this idea to do like a short movie not the documentary short film but but like a fictional short film with maybe her in the main role or at least about um, people with a disability in the main role because we discussed um, the um, like the representation of people with disability a lot. She um, is um, a very political person and she liked to talk with me about it because she knew I was uh, studying film beforehand. So, so she had this, um, she liked to get um, a feeling about how a filmmaker would think about uh, things that uh, she was annoyed by. And um, so there was a lot of dis discussion about how people with disability are represented in media and um, that inspired me to do something that maybe took another look into um, so in, into these people. So because in, in most of the films you can watch about people with disability, the disability itself is always the center conflict. Um, which they have to struggle with. And I wanted at first hand to do something like maybe they are falling in love with each other or they are doing a bank heist or something like that. There, there are, they, so that <laughs> the disability is not the main conflict, but just something uh, they have to, um, that is part of their life, like um, a haircut for another person. Yeah. And um, then she confronted us um, um, personal assistants, she had a few of them, and that she is going to have a child. That is her plan, and we should um, think about it if we can um, carry that through her, if we um, have um, the guts to do it. And um, that was, I, I found it was a great idea. I found it very interesting, and I wanted to, to somehow um, document her her whole uh, journey. And that was the beginning of the film. But it took a lot of um, work to um, get her to say yes. It wasn't that easy for a long time. She wasn't sure if she really wanted the camera to be like her companion for at least two years. And at the end, it uh, were free. We were, yeah, yeah, going together. No, I, I found that a really interesting question during the film. I had to ask myself the mo the moral question. It's like, like there's obviously this is a person who is wants a child but was not going to be able to do this on her own like at all. She's going to need the help of not just her family but of a caretaker of somebody who's possibly not her family. And so I was wondering what that evolution was like for you, um, knowing that this is coming and knowing that this is happening. Well, it, it wasn't that easy to, to form like just an opinion for myself because um, we, so questions you were pondering about, they are quite central, I think, for all um, people without disability when they are watching this movie and when they saw her, when they realized that she had uh, this, um, this goal uh, or when she talked about it. So um, they wanted to talk all, all people who uh, were um, who knew about her plan wanted to talk about it, but nobody had the guts to do it with her. So we, as the personal assistants, always were the persons who had to um, take 
on this discussion by proxy. It was always like when Eva Maria was out of the, um, so not in the room, then they started to talk with us about it and how we think uh, this will end. And, and so we were always in this position where we like, we were trying to take a neutral stance. I think all of us uh, personal assistants back then. And, and at the same time, we, we tried at least a little bit to defend it because it, um, or at least to make it clear how she was approaching this whole um, this whole plan and how she wanted to to accomplish it. And so, even now, I'm not sure if I can give their a, a, a real answer if how I am feeling about it because I saw how it ended up going and it went very well. And I tried to support her as good as possible during my part of this journey. Um, yeah, so it, I don't know. It's it's a complicated question, but it's great that uh, you are pondering about it. That was the intention uh, behind Absolutely. the movie, so that um, other people are going in there with a lot of um, suspicion about her plan, and then hopefully the movie sorts it out at least a little bit. I mean, uh, as a father of two, um, then again, the infancy of my children is now a while ago, but um, I remember very, very well this feeling of the lack of sleep and holding a crying baby and uh, and one and just, OK, this is just temporary. This is just temporary. But I'm, I'm wondering and be honest if you can. Um, were you ever thinking this is for a movie? This is for a movie. I'm making a movie. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. So, so this part, yeah, there's, um, I never wanted to be a, uh, such a big part in the movie. That wasn't the plan at the beginning. I wanted right. to have this, this colorful um, group around her with different people, all her personal assistants that carry her through this thing. But um, somehow it never turned out like I wanted. They, they never had time or they didn't want it to. And there was a lot of change. And at the end, I was the, the main protagonist beside her right. so um yeah there's always this little thing where you're thinking i'm doing this uh, because of the movie but i think most of the time like uh it was not in so much in the forefront but yeah when you're talking about uh sitting with too little sleep in in a chair and trying to feed the baby yeah that was uh, a very <laughs> intense moment it was very um exhausting like you are now uh, trying to accomplish the things with all the cameras and with the technology, uh, the technology yeah. behind you. Yeah, I was feeling like that in a moment, and I was uh, exhausted. I had no sleep. I was totally exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jonathan, I want to talk about Swimmer because I I actually previously saw um, your your student film, um, the one that uh, won the Academy Award. When I saw Swimmer, I thought, wait, this is the same director. You know, this is a very, very different voice. And so I thought, OK, let me see what else he's done. And I noticed that you mostly have done thrillers um, and Swimmer completely departs from that almost, you know. And so I was wondering what the decision making was to depart that strongly from the stuff you've done previously. Well, uh, I think it, it was really like um... I mean, if, if you uh, if you do a certain kind of film one day, you want to do another kind of film the next day, uh, and it's it's like like you know you don't want to have the same dinner every evening. Uh, um, but I, I I think like this was sort of a challenge with Swimmer actually, which I hadn't really anticipated. Is that uh, it's really so anticlimactic? It, it doesn't. I mean, uh, as you say, there is no really real attention. Uh, it's and that's sort of the point. It's like the opposite of tension, um, and, and and I hadn't really realized that. I mean, how hard that was actually going to be to show that to show like the passage of time without it becoming boring. Uh, so I, but but I guess like what what drew me to it was just that it was this. Um, uh, I read this news item uh, like 10 years ago, which said that there were two policemen trying to arrest a man in a pool and he refused to get up. And, and then they just uh, was, were talking to him for 45 minutes before he got up. Uh, and, and it was just like this really short news item. And I was like, that's, that's a really interesting scene. And, and why did this guy not want to come up? And, 
and how how did like people around him react and, and like uh, so I I just had that in my head and I just um, uh, started thinking about it again and then uh, I mean I'm I'm usually attracted to quite different projects and like. It's usually just like when you get sort of like a physical reaction and, and when you like feel like uh, when, when you can't really stop thinking about it that that's that's really when i want to uh, when when i feel like this is something that i want to explore in a, in a film yeah i mean i have a really interesting quote from you which uh, uh, i'm gonna read out if that's okay um I'm okay. very moved by watching people in awkward situations. Those sorts of situations make us aware of ourselves, the limits of our abilities and feelings, and awkward situations also make us aware of the absurdity of our society, our rules, and our constructions. And I felt that that was very, very true for at least four of the short films I've seen of yours, that you really hone in on what's the social construct and how absurd is it? I was wondering if you could elaborate on why this awkwardness, uh, why you like this awkwardness in films. Well, usually I'm, I'm interested in finding something that I haven't seen before. Uh, and, and sort of also, it's also very interesting to sort of take some awkward situations that I've experienced or seen in a news item or something and just sort of twist it quite a lot. Uh, and they also have to have this sort of tension so that, that yeah. it really it captivates me and then hopefully it will captivate the people who are watching it later. Uh, and so I think that's sort of like, um, well, basically uh, like trying to find the small part of, of reality and, and sort of maybe twisting it a little bit. And, and um, uh, I think that's sort of my, my process when I make short films. I noticed that you made 10, like at least your IMDb lists 10 short films. Is, is, are you drawn to the format or are you looking to expand beyond short films? Uh, I really like the short film format and, and I, I really like how uh, how you can like you, you you can just take these small stories that you can't make into a feature and and like uh, you, you can make a film about a moment you can make a film about uh, just a, a, a character i mean it, it can be very very um uh, like a, a small fragment but but and that small fragment can say very much about the whole world or or, or life or society um and uh, yeah, so, so that's why I've been so interested in, in making short films. Uh, however, now I'm actually developing feature. Okay, nice. Yeah. Um, Susanna, I have a quote from you that I also found very interesting. And I want to see if you could elaborate on that. Um, People are complex, complicated, changeable, unreadable creatures. And it is our identities that are always fluid and fixed. You know, so you you say that it, they are both fluid and fixed at the same time. And I was wondering if you could talk about that and how that relates to, like, if you if you could relate that to a character in Alcit, you know, who is both fluid and fixed. Um, well, I would say that uh, the most complex character in uh, in the film is Alcit, uh, largely because of the extent of her life. Uh, everybody else is embodying the roles. The young girl is only 15 years old. She's still trying to find herself. Uh, she doesn't speak in the film, so she doesn't let you know exactly what it is that she wants. We understand from her actions. Um, and then the other young people probably have not had enough time to have all of the experiences of El Sid. El Sid is uh, somebody that even though I wrote her character, I still don't fully understand her because I think once you write a character, especially if it's a complex character, they escape your uh, control. So uh, this is what I mean by uh, by the fluidity of identity, um, and especially with Elsit, because she's also contradictory. Um, she is looking for freedom within 
tradition. So even though she is controlling and uh, she lives a very traditional life and she wants a, a very she wants an arranged marriage for her young uh, granddaughter, she wants the granddaughter to marry an old man so he can die so she can be free. So she still wants freedom, but she does it in a very kind of uh, twisted way. Yeah, I found the um, duality of the social environment very interesting because you have um, simultaneously in Al Cid you have uh, uh, a character who despises what colonialism was and still is now you know even though it's not colonialism as such but you have the economic colonialism of the big powers and uh, um, you take the middle eastern perspective as opposed to a western perspective but the western perspective is brought in because of the british um you have that the um uh, disregard for that culture but conversely you have the young man who's supposed to be the uh, um uh the suitor for um, the granddaughter. Um, and he also has very little regard for the quaint ways of the cotton farmers in Sudan. I, I, would you, I just want to sort of get a sense of what your position was in this, what the point you were trying to make with the two different sides of disrespecting each other. Um, uh, I'm trying to not say anything specifically, but uh, to show a situation that is actually quite common, uh, especially uh, in the agricultural, in the rural areas where development is something that is very much needed, but at the same time, it's extremely suspicious because uh, this area, this cotton growing area, um, the industry part of uh, cotton farming in Sudan is a colonial project. It's a British colonial project. So it's an immediately under suspicion. So anybody who comes from the outside, even though he's Sudanese, um, is also treated with suspicion because he's coming as a neo-colonial force. So El Sit immediately uh, dislikes him. Um, and then there's a very fine balance between development and uh, community development. So uh, agricultural development is something that uh, people find suspicious because the money goes out of the country, not necessarily for the development of the country. Um, and we saw that with the British colonial project in which they bought the, um, the trains and the train lines, but the train lines literally go from the agricultural project to the export. You know, so it's not there for development of the people, it's there for the development of the industry. Um, and you, but you, what you do show is the middle ground, which is the parents, because the parents simultaneously say, why should we listen to those old people and want to woo the young man, you know, uh, but also, you know, fear for the safety of their daughter to make sure it's okay. So they are the ones that are trying to ride the line. I think, I mean, it seems like that's the generation that seems to be trapped in between. Yeah, well, this is this is what I find interesting about a story that includes three generations. And if you include three generations in one story, you necessarily have three different points of view and three different philosophies of life. So uh, El Sit is a very traditional kind of uh, power holder. The parents are social climbers. They, they want the good things in life. They want material goods. And then you have the young generation who is speaking out against both of these things. They are trying to forge their own path. If there is a simple point that you could that that that, that you could summarize your film in, that where you say, this is the point I would like people to see, what's the point you were trying to make? Uh, <laughs> the simple points are always the hardest to determine. Um, I would just say that this is a story of a family and every family is complex. That's a great simple point. I like that. Um, uh, Lucas, um, tell me a little bit more about the process of making Eva Maria. Um, tell me about how long it took you, but also what the editing process was like and where your decision making came in from telling this story. Um, so the, the shooting process took us um, about three years, which at least for my estimations was uh, quite short. I, I estimated a lot of longer time period because you never know uh, or you never could um, estimate if she gets pregnant or not. So, so it, we or 
I myself was um, calculating a lot more time than it needed. Um, and it, from the shooting process, it was um, quite an intense time. I did most of the things myself. So I was like a one man show. I did the, the camera, I did the audio side. Um, I, I tried to be a director and for a lot of scenes I always I also was um, before the camera as a personal assistant. That wasn't something I would do again, but it was quite an uh, interesting challenge. And I think it was the only way we could shoot it um, like we did, because it is uh, quite an intimate topic. And for a long time, it was clear that I would be the only person she would allow into the space. Um, we opened it a little bit at the end when uh, she was more um, so when she knew the camera, she knew me better, how I worked. So then I tried to introduce at least some uh, person for the audio side, because that was uh, on a, was maybe the most challenging part to get um, suitable audio and picture at the same time. Um, so it was like a run and gun approach. And it was a lot of, um, so, the, the form was decided by this um, by, by the, the, the technology uh, or the situation. The, the form was decided by the situation I was working in. I had to do everything myself, so it was clear. Uh, the camera had to be positioned on a tripod because I couldn't move with it um, because I had to do the audio. And it was clear that we have to um, decide or be very precise in our decisions. When it came to editing, how long did that take you? And I'm assuming you had a lot of footage um, like this. Um, how long did it take you to get through um, and to find your story when you were, even when you were, like I'm assuming you were editing as you were going, but still like at some point it was the edit, right? So how long did that take you? Well, we we didn't edit it during the process. Really, I, I shot for I think two and a half years. Um, it, it took us a lot of time to fund this movie. So I was shooting um, while we are trying to get the funding because n nature doesn't wait for a for the money. So um, I was I was shooting with her and we tried to get the funding and. When we finally got uh, the, the money, then basically most of the shooting was already done. Um, we had a few shooting days um, after our, uh, I think, two thirds of the editing process, but mo most of it was achieved in one go when the m most of the material was already there. It was around about 100 hours and it Gosh. took me like, um, I think, one and a half months to get through all of the material. And I'm very glad about my editor, about uh, Lisa Gerritschläger. I couldn't have done it without her. And it was her precise um, view or her precise knowledge of the material that made it possible to edit it um, like it is now. I, I wouldn't have been, um, I'm, I'm too attached to this material. So for me, it was very difficult to get through this, to, to see that uh, the important parts to see the story within all of this material. Um, and we did a lot on paper. We, uh, so because we had quite a tight um, editing schedule, we hadn't, hadn't much, so much time. So it wasn't an option to like try everything um, on, in, in the edit. We had to do it with paper. So we printed out um, a picture for every interesting moment that happened during the shooting process and then we stood over a table and moved them around for a long time and tried to get a hold of the the, um, the story and and we we used this uh, through the whole process so all um even at the end we were um, going back and forth between the paper version of our film and uh, the edited version that's that's really interesting to hear. Like I've always found documentary editing to be a, a very fascinating left field way of thinking. Like you're not thinking in any kind of traditional way when it comes to cutting together material because you don't have coverage. It just doesn't really exist in the same way normally. Um, so I, I always find 
documentary editing to be very, very creative. And as I highly respect what you did with the film, it's really good. Um, let me talk about one more thing um, with each of you. Um, and yeah, let's start with you, Lucas. Um, you're, I'm sure you're thinking about your next project already um, with all the attention this film has gotten and, uh, and uh, with, you know, as filmmakers do, we always think, try to think about our next idea. Um, you don't have to tell me what your next idea is, but I'd like to find out from you how you're going about realizing your next idea right now, because for documentaries, it's a bit different than for short films because there isn't a script in the normal sense. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely working on the next project already. Um, I got a little bit of help from uh, the Austrian government. There are like, um, um, like funds for um, young filmmakers to get into the business. And I got one of them and I don't know how to translate it in, in English, but it's called Staatsstipendium in German. Yeah. And um, so my process or maybe, I don't know, it's always um, my point uh, of view for documentaries is that at least for a little bit, you have to live in the shoes of your protagonists because you don't want this exotized view from the outside. You don't want to create an imaginative version that has more to do with uh, uh, the, the point of view society already has and it should um, represent them on a more fundamentally and honest level. And so what I'm trying to do in my new project is to um, get to live a little bit with all of my potential protagonists. So I try to meet them in person. Um, as far as I can go, I will go with them through their day to day life, to, to, through their routines, through their work. It depends on, on what I'm interested in. But I try to really get to know them. I don't want to um, be in this position of not understanding the world because then you're just recreating stereotypes you already know. And I think you have to go quite deep in there, understand them emotionally, but also on an ideological level. You don't have to um, have the same ideo ideology, but I think you have to at least understand the way of thinking. So it is, uh, my process is quite time consuming and it's um, trust building, a lot of trust building. Yeah, of course, I believe that. Absolutely. Uh, Jonathan, let's talk about you and how, I mean, with with uh, that many films that you've done, I'd like to find out from you how um, you get your next ideas made, not just from like the idea or story perspective, but, you know, the, the mechanics of it, like um, uh, from the script to uh, um, uh, if it's you, you, sometimes you write yourself, sometimes you collaborate with other writers. Um, that would be an interesting thing to find out. But also, you know, what are the next steps that you take? Um, did Is the critical acclaim that your films have brought you, does that help you or has it not helped you at all? Um yeah yeah it's uh, it's definitely helped me uh so I, I i as i said i made a lot of shorts but most of them weren't like funded or anything so swimmer is the first time where i have a proper budget to work with uh so it got funding from the swedish film institute and swedish tv and uh like like a regional funding center also um what was the budget uh, of swimmer it was uh like a hundred thousand euros wow it's a big budget for a short film. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So, so it it uh, it was a lot, and everybody got paid. And uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great to finally be able to work with like a, a professional resources. Um, uh, so uh, I I enjoy working both working with writers, but also writing myself. So. I'm, uh, I have like one feature in development that I've been writing myself for the last year, uh, and it's got some development funding. Uh, and then uh, also some other projects that are much earlier in, in development. Um, and also maybe there's also another project that's gonna be like a commissioned work for a streamer uh, where, I'm, where I'll just be directing somebody else's script. So. Uh, I, I quite enjoy this sort of like uh, different approaches also every time. Uh, like spending the last year writing is, is, uh, has been great in many ways, but also it's just been like me sitting like, like, like this. So 
I, I really enjoy also just like getting out there and directing something. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, that, that's that's what I'm gonna do next. Um, so, th was it uh, so? So, for you, the the festival attention and obviously the the student academy award has helped you uh, uh, a bit in being taken more seriously. Do you see a, a clear difference in between um, the time when you were trying to ask for funding before? Did you just always fund your films before that? Yes, it's it's been a lot easier to find funding, um, and also like like these these doors that are now open to to making feature films uh, have finally sort of opened. I mean, I've been offered things, um, and also like I after the Student Academy Award, I I was approached by a lot of agents and managers, and so I got an agent in the UK and an agent in Sweden. Um, uh, and so that has also helped me quite a lot. Uh, I mean, but but it's been, I mean, the first short films I made uh, were like in 2006. So it, it's been like a pretty long journey and I've been working with other things. I was working as a production sound technician for quite some time uh, for, for, um, for TV, uh, like really bad TV shows. Uh, and I was also like, uh, as, as, as Lucas, I was a, a caretaker for a single right. person. Uh, and, 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 and like, and all this time I was making short films here and there. And then finally, like now, finally I can make a living as a director. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's a long, uh, it's been a long journey, but, but uh, I feel like I'm on the right uh, path. That's great, and that's really glad to hear. And uh, Susanna, um, talk about El Cid's uh, um, budget and schedule a little bit, because uh, you mentioned that you'd never filmed there before. Did you use Sudanese crew, and did you? Uh, um, uh, what does the budget? What What's the budget like compared to, say, filming in and in Qatar? Yeah, well, uh, I'm currently based in Qatar, so we have uh, the Doha Film Institute, which is really a the central hub for filmmaking uh, in Qatar. It's where I wrote the script in a script writing workshop, and I got a uh, production grant, a small production grant, uh, $10,000 to uh, make the short. It wasn't enough, obviously, as Jonathan knows, you know, <laughs> it's not enough to make a film. So I had to do a lot of begging, family, um, and a lot of my own investment, because I really wanted to make this film. And it is also my first uh, film with a proper budget. Everything else was, you know, just uh, um, tiny, tiny budgets. But this was the first proper budget where we could pay people, we could rent equipment and so on. And then we traveled to Sudan to make this film. Sudan doesn't necessarily have a film industry, but they have hugely talented professionals who work in uh, commercials and television. And so you got your crew primarily from that? But the actors, like not all the young actors, the first time actors. Right. So that was going to add, that was my next question is how many of them were non actors? Was it pretty much everyone? Yeah, we, 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 we really don't have a constant film industry. We have people who make films every few years. So there's not enough to sustain uh, acting as a career. Um, so all the young actors, we, they're all first time actors, and the older actors work for the theater. They're, uh, they're stage actors. What was the amount of time it took to film a sit? What, uh, what, what was your uh, schedule like for, for Al Cid? Okay, it, it, it took almost no time at all. Like uh, the whole thing was wrapped up. Uh, the actual shoot was eight days. And uh, the lead up to that, the pre-production was uh, just about three or four weeks. Are you, will you continue uh, down the, uh, sort of the Sudanese angle or are you looking at uh, uh, other cultures, other ideas to explore? Is, or is this the thing you really want to talk about? Uh, yes, well, I'm, I'm currently working on my first feature. Uh, it's called Cotton Queen. And uh, El Cid was actually the proof of concept uh, for my first feature. When I started writing the script for El Cid, it grew out of hand. It, it, it became uh, halfway between a short and a feature. And then I was just not prepared at the time to make a feature. Um, I had not shot in Sudan before, so we really needed something short and sweet to be able to uh, to show to future funders um, and then we just hoped that it would do well and people would like it and um, 
and then move on to make the feature. So I'm currently, uh, my feature is called Cotton Queen and it's in development. Um, and uh, are you still sort of at the script stage or are you looking, are you already out looking for partners? It's advanced script um, and uh, currently looking for co-producers. Are you looking primarily in Europe or are you looking Asia? Um, how, do, how, does your, how does your process work for that? Uh, wherever, you know, it's like, uh, it's a, it's a, a, it's a story that I'm uh, quite confident that people all over the world can relate to. And I'm very open to, I'm also learning about the uh, co-productions um, because when we made El Cid, it was a small team. So this is all new to me and I want to learn about uh, this whole process in the first place as well. So talking to a lot of people at the moment. So thank you very much, guys, for joining me. Thank you, Susanna, Jonathan, and Lucas for sharing the stories of your films. Um, they were really fantastic to watch. I enjoyed each and every one of them. And they're really nice and diverse stories and uh, of very, very interesting people. Um, and uh, the stories of how you made them uh, is, is really inspiring. And I hope uh, that you guys um, are going to make more stuff that I can watch in the future. I'm very, very much looking forward to that. Um, so. Uh, for everybody watching and listening, of course, um, the UK Film Festival is happening at the end of the month from the 24th to the 27th. Um, please make sure if you're in the UK, uh, come and visit, buy tickets. You can come to our website. And if you sign up to the newsletter, you can actually get 50% off on the tickets. So please make sure you do. Um, and uh, we hope to see you there. I will be there. Um, uh, our producer, Ariana, will be there. Uh, and the whole team will all be there, including a bunch of Center Frame members. So uh, please come down, hang out. Let's have a drink it's our first event so we're all super excited about it thank you very much guys for joining me on the meeting and thank you for listening and watching mm -hmm.